We begin, Susanna, with you, and, um, well, he's on the front page of, of many of the newspapers today, uh, this young lad who's been branded the hammer killer. Yes, he's called a de devil child, isn't he, on one paper. The, I was looking in the Times, though, because it talks at some length about how he's been watching, you know, obviously uh, the soaps with their violent stories, the story of the hammer killing, and also others. And I, I was really struck by this, these lines here. It says um, that he'd showed emotional detachment and a lack of empathy and, and no remorse. And that they haven't th thought that he's had mental illness but just showed no remorse. And I think, you know, it's, it's kind of old-fashioned, isn't it, to think that perhaps if you uh, assume that films are going to lead somebody into violence. But actually, this is a 14-year-old child who's not, been watching them. But, you know, it's easy for newspaper to say this, but is the truth not that this child would have been predisposed towards this and attracted to films that show that sort of thing rather than him being um, uh, corrupted by Coronation Street? Yeah, oh, and I'm not suggesting he's necessarily corrupted by Coronation Street. They've very, been very clear about everything that they've shown before, the, the pre-watershed, etc. Mm -hmm. But, it's, I mean, it says that he'd Googled things like how to, mur how to get away with murder, and he'd also look, been watching Saw and other clips online. So I suppose there is something about that being predisposed, but also if you're going to be continually bombarded by those images, and if you uh, are allowed to have access to those images, it's going to change your attitude towards violence, it's going to rewire your brain. doesn't yeah. it, as well? You just become used to those scenes and those acts and they yeah. become almost ordinary. And that's exactly what the research says. It says that it, that it makes them you know, feel that violence really isn't something, a big deal. It, you know, even looking at brains, the research has shown that they don't spark off in the same way and they mm. see violent acts. It's just sort of lack of empathy. And I just think it's, you know, really quite chilling. I yeah, yeah, I'm just, gonna, I'm just going to take the other line now just to give a sense of balance. Mm. This is, in The Guardian, it had an interesting comment mm. on this, which it, it, it describes as shriveling the domain of privacy. And I, I, I thought the really interesting thing that I had to say about it was that it was this distinction between probing bills, which you've already been, always been able to do, having a look at sort of who's called who, and uh, going towards tapping. And the, it, this is what the distinction they made. And it says the old distinction between glancing at the records of calls and listening in is blurred when it comes to web searches. Because, of course, actually, as we just heard about this boy typing mm. in this horrific thing, how to get away with murder, mm. actually you can find out a lot about a person, as Google knows, from what they type into their web searches. So in that, and, and also in terms of things like Skype calls, where you can actually listen in, it, it's not quite the same as not mm. reading their texts or not reading their emails. And, of course, an email subject gives away a lot. So I think okay. there's a, it's a slippage between those two things. It's the interesting thing there. Uh, we go to The Guardian, and uh, the story, story here, Susanna, is um, about the, uh, the commemoration, the services, which are held uh, to commemorate the 30 years after the um, Argentinian invasion of the Falklands. Yes, well, obviously, this, this story is everywhere, um, and it's about Argentina's president saying that this is a leftover story from the 19th century. Um, and that it's uh, injustice, it's absurd, ridiculous, a colonial enclave. But it just seems to me that she's using history really badly because the British have been in Argentina since 1833. Uh, to go back to talking about a time when Argentina, or the Spanish, not even Argentina, but the Spanish were there, so another colonial power, you need to go back to the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, the Spanish left in 1811. So, they actually abandoned the Falkland Islands in 18... So the, the, the suggestion that there's any claim on them, this kind of geographical determinism that the, Ar that the Falkland Islands belong to Argentina, actually, you have to hark back to a, a colonial past even before that. So I, it just seems like the use of history here is, is really quite shoddy, and uh, <laughs> as well as, as generally being a little bit ridiculous itself. Susanna, we go to the eye. Universities, a call for them to teach basic skills. What do we mean by basic skills? Reading and writing. Really? Reading and writing and basic arithmetic. Um, because the problem is that people are coming up to university level and aren't prepared. And um, I, I particularly, it says, in terms of critical thinking and academic writing. And it's, it's the case because A-levels are preparing them more and more for these modules where they have to um, tick the boxes and give for yeah. and against. You're taught the test. Or you're taught, you're, they're you are teaching taught the, the test. test, yeah. And, um, and they're, they're taught now to write very short essays. I mean, when I did 
A-level history quite a long time ago. You had to do three hours and oh, four wow. essays, and now they have to do, um, at least for part of it, an hour and 15 minutes. And they have to get a lot done during that time. They have to be capable, but they don't have to write at any length, mm -hmm. and they're not required to think about things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a real problem. How do they pass it if they can't spell? Uh, I think more and more spelling is Irrelevant. overlooked spelling in terms of... No, yeah, but, yeah, it's a spelling it amnesty. Yeah, as long as you can it? just get the ball over the net, you can be understood. Mm. It doesn't matter if it's... So actually, it's not really the exams that's the problem. It's the teaching that's led up to the exams, because... Well, the, 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 you can understand that teachers would want to prepare their students to do as well as possible in the exams, especially because universities look at the grades they get. So the emphasis is more and more on... A, a good school will prepare those students for those yes. exams. Susanna, uh, ten minutes ago, Charlotte made the outrageous claim, which will have her sent to the tower, that the <laughs> Queen is a vampire. Can you clear this up? Well, a, the Daily Mirror is giving us a whole load of crown spiracy theories, that's what it calls them. And one of them is this extraordinary suggestion that the Queen is a vampire. And, and if anyone can explain this to me, that's why she always wears big hats. It says that she's related to Vlad the Impaler. The Windsors are descended from the 15th century Romanian warlord who inspired Bram Stoker's novel. Uh, anyway, quite extraordinary. It also suggests that Wallace Simpson was a man and suffered from intersexuality, now known as a disorder of sexual development. So if you want your theories uh, to be lively and weird today, this is where to look. So okay. the, the Queen wears a big hat to disguise a massive vampire's head. Vampires don't have horns or anything, do they? You'd oh. think that maybe it'd be something to do with her teeth, but no, it's her head, apparently. Well, and the fact it. that we see her out and about in daylight. You yeah. know. <laughs> oh, that rather spoils it, doesn't it? You just solved the whole Sorry. thing. <laughs>